been. Uh, yesterday in uh, Professor Anil Gupta's uh, talk, uh, he also spoke about that uh, nothing can be inclusive unless we think of the consumer also. How something can be made usable by uh, a very heterogeneous part of the population. And uh, that's where uh, my colleague Jyoti also uh, comes in there. Because she's going to be talking about uh, the consumer perspective, uh, how tea plays a very major role in the health and nutrition aspects for the masses. Okay, uh, so these are some of the stakeholders. These are not all the stakeholders uh, in tea, but uh, some of the stakeholders uh, in tea manufacture. And I think I spoke about journey towards inclusiveness. I don't think inclusiveness can, the equality can ever be achieved. What is inclusiveness? It's about sharing uh, the wealth generated, the value generated equally amongst all the stakeholders. Uh, but uh, it's the nature, uh, it's, it's a law of nature that every group of stakeholders will try to accumulate wealth for itself, right? Oh, uh, and wealth will only be distributed if uh, we live in an economy which is uh, open, which is innovative, because whenever there are inequalities built in, then there will be uh, scientists like us, policymakers like uh, us will come in and uh, try to address wherever there is a need and make the whole uh, value chain more inclusive. So some of the stakeholders uh, given here, uh, uh, I think uh, the one we are most familiar with are the pluckers, which is the second block in here. Uh, and uh, tea certainly creates employment in very remote places, yeah? uh, places where there is uh, hardly any other employment. Uh, it's grown in uh, really remote places, so almost more than a million pluckers, 60% of whom are women. So we spoke about gender diversity, so it certainly plays on the gender diversity perspective. Uh, to give you a perspective, we produce, India produces about uh, 1.2, 1.3 billion kgs of tea, which is about 1 kg of tea per person. And uh, so we have about a million pluckers, so each plucker about 1,000 kgs is what they uh, pluck and make tea, contribute towards making tea every year. Then uh, we have, of course, the Chaiwalas of India, and we have the most famous Chaiwala of India is the Prime Minister of India right, today. Uh, so uh, it's tea is the lowest cost startup probably, yeah, opportunity available. There are more than a million, I think my estimate is somewhere around 3 million Chaiwalas in the country, yes, and uh, which means about 15 million people being supported. Uh, so that certainly is inclusive. Uh, and then we come to this revolution which has been going on. Yeah? Uh, tea was largely a big estate operation about say, 15 years ago, till the small grower revolution started happening. So people living on the margins of the big estates, the small farmers started converting their small land holdings, these are land holdings less than 10 hectares, into tea plantations, small tea plantations or tea gardens. Of course they needed factories to process that. And so the big guys came in into setting up factories, the big factories. Uh, Tata's have two huge factories they have set up. Uh, we are setting up uh, third party factories to support these uh, tea growers. And now almost 34% of tea available in the market is made by tea growers. All happened in the last 15 years. So that's a revolution which has largely gone unnoticed. Uh, and then lastly, the consumers, the last block in there. Tea is the second most consumed beverage in the world. The first is water, right? So this is the second most consumed, uh, second most consumed beverage. And it's a drink of the masses and classes, uh, a lifestyle choice as we call. And here I'll uh, bring Jyoti in to talk a little bit about it. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, just a little bit on the lifestyle choice, why we think tea is um, a good lifestyle choice. And I'll just take you to the next slide. Um, and um, so a very important aspect of inclusive manufacturing is yeah the impact that um, you know a product has on the environment and also uh, the cost of uh, delivering it that to the consumer and here we've borrowed what uh, you know the, some of the words that uh, professor roy mentioned which uh, we think very nicely gives a context to what we are trying to you know bring to you a story of tea so at the um, at the um, far right what you see on your uh, slide is a study that was done by um, Friends of the Earth, and it was uh, basically to look at, um, you know, a, about seven commonly consumed goods and the cost of producing the goods, goods on the environment. So it's actually what you see there, I'm not sure if it's really visible, the, the one on the green actually tells you the, the cost of, um, you know, it's, uh, the green is the land use and what, uh, the blue one is the water use. So if you look at boots, the smartphone, uh, a t-shirt, 
some of the commonly consumed foods, um, you know, chicken curry, and then you have the, uh, the tea and coffee, what you'd notice is the cost of producing a thing like smartphone is quite huge on the environment. And on the contrary, a thing like tea is actually very, it has a very tiny footprint. So this was done using the entire life cycle approach in the manufacturing process. So that's, that's a very important um, aspect of, uh, you know, um, of uh, growing tea. Uh, but not just that, there's also uh, the cost of delivering uh, tea to the consumers. And in a country like ours, uh, you know, the penetration of tea is 97%, which is a huge population consuming tea. So it is quite an accessible, uh, you know, uh, drink uh, to the population. A cost of a cup of tea is hardly a few rupees. So, um, you know, so it, it's, it's indeed that's something that's very, very accessible. But if it's accessible, it's also important that it's indeed good. And, um, and a very important uh, piece of work that's happening in the scientific world is to uh, look at some of the phytonutrients and the impact that it can have on health uh, of individuals. And T actually, this chart actually shows uh, an, a very important phytonutrient, flavonoids. Uh, and there's a huge body of uh, evidence that's accumulating now to look at longer term health impacts of uh, consuming foods and drinks that are rich in uh, uh, flavonoids. And it's interesting to see, you know, the amount of flavonoids that a cup of tea can deliver. You can see how uh, some of the other foods uh, compare. Of course, it's not to talk about the other goodies that could come from the foods like vitamins, uh, minerals, etc. But it's just to say that, you know, there are indeed quite a few um, phytonutrients that uh, a large part of the population can take advantage of. And indeed, as the evidence uh, shows that flavonoids are quite, uh, have a very beneficial effect on um, uh, things like cardiovascular health, etc. So it's, it's as well as uh, gut health. So for a population like ours, which uh, struggles with double burden of malnutrition, a thing like tea can be a great uh, lifestyle choice. I think that the previous chart actually shows how much amount of a certain material uh, you need to, to get the same amount of flavonoids. And you can see that uh, things on the right, you require a huge amount, almonds almost 2 kgs, and tea only one cup will deliver that. So that's the kind of power that is packed into tea. Uh, I think another interesting aspect of tea, and I mentioned that in one of my previous talks as well, uh, is that uh, tea we consider as, I mean, uh, passionate about tea, so we think tea actually defines an era, right? Uh, and so I have this uh, uh, BCE and CE on the right, that's common era on the right, and BCE is before common era, that's how we define eras, right? Uh, for us who work on tea, we say that it's not CE, is not common era, it's caffeine era, and BCE is before caffeine era. And the world has changed quite dramatically since tea was found, and I think along with tea, coffee, and, uh, and cocoa, those are three main drinks. And if you look at modern world today, uh, 100 of us in this room for two days, and there's not been a single fight. We have had nice discussions. Before tea and coffee, this was simply not possible. You pack 100 people in a room, and in 10 minutes, they would be fighting with each other. And today's modern world, which runs on industries which require thousands of workers within one roof, or the IT world, since we are in Bangalore, which again requires a lot of people in there, tea, coffee play a major role in all of us working together, collaborating constructively, and that's inclusiveness. Yeah, that's an example of inclusiveness. OK, uh, this also talks about uh, the history of processing. Okay, uh, I think there are two key aspects I wanted to point out, that while uh, we are on a journey, uh, what are the things which are required to move on from this journey and create further inclusiveness? One, of course, is the big data approach, and we move to processing things like processing 4.0, etc., from where we are, from the industrial production where we are, and use the digital uh, inputs into improving the efficiencies. But equally, I think this point was made again and again uh, yesterday, that we also need to look at the shift from industrial to the artisanal processing. But this artisanal processing is not old processing. It's about how can we use technology in there to make craft teas. Yeah. Because uh, markets are becoming accessible online. Packaging is becoming accessible online. Branding is becoming accessible to common people. And with that, artisanal processing can actually be much higher value. That can be the mass product, and this can be the value product, which could be a game changer here. Low cost. That's pressure data and temperature data. right? Uh, when they became available at low cost, the equations required to use them constructively are already available from 200 years ago. Those are the gas laws, the equations of state, Charles' law, Boyle's mm -hmm. law, Avogadro's number, etc., which are available to us, Raoult's law. And therefore, 
when this data became available, the uh, whole petrol refinery industry could actually run with just pet, uh, pet, uh, pressure and temperature sensor and you have kilometer long refineries uh, being run with those two pieces of data and that's why we are in the oil economy today. If you look at today, what are the pieces of data becoming really cheap? Yeah, four pieces of data I have here. One is the genomics data, second is the weather data, third is the satellite, the image data, which is the color data essentially, the grayscale data and fourth the soil data which is still very expensive but is becoming lower cost. Uh, but there is no equation of state to actually combine them. Nobody's really worked on developing algorithms to combine and make them usable for, uh, for, for say, agronomy. And that's what we are trying to do in our research, that we are trying to do this to help the breeding programs, to generate new cultivars, to generate smart agri uh, practices. And then, of course, the sensor technology to then take us into the, small, into the smart factories. And we try and bring this together. Just as an example, today, when we want to make the small uh, farmer revolution, today to get a new breed, it takes about 20 years to develop. Yeah. If we want inclusiveness, the small farmers do not have the capacity to hold on for 20 years or something new to arrive. So unless we get this right and we have the solutions in a reasonable time scale available to, uh, to this vast set of entrepreneurs, we will not be very successful yeah, with our technologies. And with that point, I think integrating growers, factories, buyers, brands, consumers, all the stakeholders yeah, for a more inclusive industry is what we need to work towards. Yeah. Thank you.